away my first slide. Whoops, okay. Okay, the recording is in progress. Um, so Uwe took away my first slide. So I recently joined the Humboldt Universität. I spent a lot of time in, in research in industrial research. And my focus is on natural language processing with various machine learning uh, research areas. And very much a focus of my group is to develop the open source NLP framework Flare. And so in this talk, I'd like to focus mostly on this idea of sample efficient learning, but I always talk about Flare. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Flare as well. Yeah. Uh, so the, the outline is first, I'm gonna give an introduction and a little live demo of NLP in action of a simple NLP task in action. I'm going to talk about few shot learning um, and then there is a third part, but I'm going to have to be honest that I think we might actually not have the time to do the third part, but maybe I can say a few words about Flair and then um, we can talk about more stuff offline. Yeah. So to start with the introduction. So I'd like to introduce to you a, a, a task, if you don't know it already, called text classification. Uh, and it's a very basic NLP task where given a piece of text, you want to predict labels and what labels you want to predict depend on the problem that you want to solve. So for instance, a very classic example here is sentiment analysis. So in sentiment analysis, you might, you want to, you want to identify the feeling or the, the sentiment of a text, whether the person who wrote this text was uh, in a positive mood or in a negative mood, right? So if somebody writes, for instance, a review and says, I really like this movie because blah, 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 blah then I want my sentiment classifier to detect that this, this text is positive. And if somebody writes, I really hated this movie because blah, 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 I want my sentiment classifier to detect a, a negative sentiment for this text, okay? And so I want to show you a classifier in Flare in action that, that makes this type of prediction. So I have to switch the screens, give me a second. Um, Okay. So again, the question, can you see this? Yes. Okay, good. Then I type in a text and now I'm gonna, then I'm gonna hit this button and then the machine is going to predict what the sentiment of this text is, yeah? So if I type in something like, let's be optimistic, this talk is interesting, okay? I get my sentiment prediction and now it's telling me we have two models. One is a transformer-based model, the other one is an RNN-based model. But what you can see is that in both cases for this specific text, the model has predicted uh, positive sentiment, right? And if I now write, this talk is not interesting, and I get another prediction. In this case, the model, both mo is a very simple example, right? In this case, both models, the transformer model and the RNN model have both predicted that the text is negative, negative sentiment, okay? So what if I write this talk is as interesting as watching paint dry, okay? So this is actually not a good thing. So if something is as interesting as watching paint dry, it's actually not very interesting, right? So if I give this to my sentiment classifier, what we can see is that actually both my transformer and the RNN-based model have both said that this text is negative though the confidence, the distance to the decision boundary has decreased. So the models are not certain as they were before, but they can still kind of see that watching paint dry is actually, it's not so great, right? Um, and if I now write, for instance, this talk is as interesting as watching a baseball game, then I get a prediction and the model is now telling me, um, Positive action, yeah. It's the transformer and the RNN base are both telling me that this is positive. I personally may not agree with this, but um, it seems to think that if if somebody writes as interesting as watching a baseball game, this is a positive sentiment. Okay, and so this is kind of the challenge. So you're try, trying to no, no matter what language you put in, you want to predict something uh, one of the one of the labels. And maybe very briefly, I can also show you a model. So the sentiment model actually works pretty well. We also have an emotions model and this is very experimental, but um, so the sentiment model actually can only detect positive or negative, but the emotion model can detect one of like 18 different emotions and actually one text could have multiple emotions. So if I write something like, I don't know what, uh, let's say my laptop is broken. 
or maybe with an exclamation mark, I don't know. My laptop is broken. Then the emotions that are detected <laughs> are in fact sadness, some neutralness. I'm not really sure what this emotion is. And some disappointment is detected as emotions that are kind of in this text, right? So this is very experimental, it's more for fun, but just to show you that models don't only have to predict one label, but sometimes they can predict multiple labels. So if you guys want to try out something, maybe you can type it in. Otherwise I would switch back to the presentation. Um, is there anything that should, I should try? So maybe you can think of some things and we can come back to this, okay? So I go back to the presentation. Okay, so um, this is a very simple example, sentiment analysis with two classes, but text classification in itself is actually a very basic NLP task that you essentially use everywhere, right? So for instance, if you have some sort of a, um, Amazon Alexa, for instance, at home and you give it voice commands, well, uh, behind it is actually very often the way these things are modeled is intent detection. So basically you would have some sort of an intent, turn on the lights or something like this. And then you have a classifier in the background trying to detect one of potentially hundreds of different intents that you might have that are pre predefined, like turn on light, play music, set alarm. Um, another classic example is topic classification where you have a large body of text and you want to kind of automatically categorize it into topics. Uh, and then a very current example that we also looked at uh, is hate speech detection, right? So there's actually an example in German. So where somebody might write something not so nice on the, on the internet, on the web, and then you want to detect whether this language is actually, is a good language, is a bad language, and if it is abusive language or if it's hate speech, which type of hate speech is it? Because there's actually different types, right? So you have many different types of application. And uh, text classification is a very, very basic task. Um, and as was mentioned already in the beginning, so what you have typically, this is typically modeled as a supervised learning problem. Um, and for this, you need very large amounts of labeled training data. So for instance, the sentiment classifier that I, that I showed you has two classes. And this one we trained with over 300,000 labeled examples of positive and negative sentiments. Um, the emotion data set that we used is actually much smaller and has 28 different emotions and in total only about 50,000 labeled examples. And so this data set actually works much less. So essentially the more data you have and the simpler that your problem is, the better of course your classifier is gonna be. And so this is a problem that actually gets more difficult the more classes you have, the more domains you wanna cover, the more human languages you wanna cover. So if you wanna do hate speech, not only in English, but also in German, right? Then you need even more training data. And so essentially this is a huge challenge in machine learning, right? Because training data, like 300,000 labeled examples is you know, not, not often available for most problems, right? And in fact, um, um, this labeled data is also very expensive to, to produce, right? So if you manually school humans to go through 300,000 texts and label them, this is of course very slow and very expensive. And so also maybe coming from the industry, I can tell you that labeled training data, the availability of labeled training data is in fact the main bottleneck in many, many use cases. So in the industry, we often sat around at the table, somebody came, had an idea, can we do this, can we do that? Uh, and the answer was always, if you have enough training data, yes. If you don't, we have a problem, okay? And so um, from a research point of view, this is actually kind of cool because we can ask a very simple research question. And the research question is, why do we actually require so many examples? Because if you think about it, humans can actually learn from very few examples, right? So I don't think a human needs 300,000 examples. So for instance, um, a human labeler, for instance, if I, so let's say we want to have a human that assigns positive or negative sentiment to a document, right? So that human does not need to be shown 100,000 examples. You can show, you can, you, can, you can teach the human very differently, right? And there's, I think, two major differences between humans and machines here. Uh, and the one difference is that humans actually learn a new task with very different signals. Because what you do is you actually explain the task in words. You say, okay, your task is to label documents as positive and negative, and we consider this to be positive and this to be negative. So you show them a few examples, but mostly you actually explain the task, 
right? So there's only a very limited amount of examples for like some clarification or some edge cases, but the most part is actually done by the explanation, right? Uh, and then optionally, it depends on the labeling setup. The humans could also come back to you. And if they have questions, they can ask you. Um, but you know, many, many of these things simply have like a brochure with an explanation and then some, some few examples. So this is actually very different from how the machine learns, right? Because the machine only sees examples. Uh, another big difference, big obvious difference is that humans of course already have a very broad understanding of the language, of language. I mean, we speak language, right? So we already speak language. We understand how the world works. We already understand what positive and negative sentiment actually is, okay? So we don't start from nothing. So um, whereas most machine learning models classically at least start from, from nothing, right? And we, for us as a human, we already can perform, I'm estimating 10,000 10, different tasks language tasks, different tasks, we can do so many things. And if we learn a new task, it's just one more task, right? On top of all the tasks that we already know, okay? So these are two very big differences. And so from a machine learning point of view, the research questions that we can ask is, well, can we also model this combination of explanation and examples? So why do we only show the machine learning algorithm examples? Can we not also explain the task to the machine learning algorithm? without showing examples, so just in words, right? Uh, and the second question that we might ask is, um, can we create models that's similar to how humans essentially go through life and we learn more and more tasks? Can we also have a single model that continuously learns new tasks? Yeah? And so that kind of brings us to the research, the research area. So few-shot and zero-shot learning is the model, as was already said, uh, to, to create models that can perform new NLP tasks with either nearly no training data or with no training data at all. Yeah? Uh, and so we distinguish between different kinds of scenarios. One is few shot. And in few shot, we generally only want to have between one and 10 training examples. So just show them like five examples and then the machine should figure out what, what it should be able to do. Then there is a zero shot learning. And zero shot learning, we actually show it a whopping zero training examples but we still expect the machine to be able to do a new task, even though we don't show it any examples, okay? And then there's continual learning. There we have one model that sequentially learns new tasks. So one task after the other, but at the same time, we want this model to retain all the previous tasks. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't forget the old ones just because it learned a new task, yeah? And so to, um, to address this, we presented last year an approach called TARS, uh, that I'd like to discuss with you guys uh, in this presentation. Uh, TARS um, was uh, in collaboration, was created in collaboration with Salando Research. Uh, and the first author here is Kisha Loyhalda, who's, we're all in Berlin, like Uwe said, the whole team, everybody's in Berlin, also Salando Research is in Berlin. And Kisha Loy is the mastermind of this whole, uh, of this project. Um, and he can answer all detailed questions about uh, few shot learning. So he's the man to speak to, he's, he's the mastermind here. Yeah, and so that finishes the introduction and live demo part. Maybe up to this point, are there any uh, questions? Okay, I take that as a no. Then um, let's begin with let's let's jump into few shot learning. So before we can understand few shot learning the way we do it, first we have to talk a little bit about language modeling. So language modeling, especially neural language modeling is in fact, one of the main drivers of progress in NLP research, especially over the past couple of years, it has really exploded. Yeah? And the main idea here is to make a prediction problem out of plain text. So plain text that you could find anywhere. You can crawl the web, you can have a document collection that's just plain text, no labels, no nothing. You make a prediction problem out of it. Uh, and the main idea is essentially that you take text that you found somewhere you corrupt it automatically, and then you tr train the machine to uncorrupt it. Okay, and here's how that looks like. So maybe you found a piece of text somewhere and it says, this is a very short text, obviously, it just says a mouse on the desk. And then you automatically corrupt it, for instance, if you use a masked language modeling objective by automatically removing words. So you kind of take out the word mouse, let's say, and then what remains is a <laughs> on the desk. So it is not corrupted. And now what you have, have to do is train a machine 
to predict the missing word back in. So if the machine says a mm -hmm on the desk, you train a big transformer model typically with a linear classifier on top. And it's supposed to predict that the missing word in this context is mouse. Okay, it only sees the, the context, it sees the missing word and has to predict that the word is mouse. Uh, and this problem actually has a lot of advantages. So one of them is that it's in fact a very, very difficult language problem. It may, maybe if you look at this, you're saying, oh, it's actually easy. It's actually not so easy yeah? because you have to understand, because in order to understand that the missing word here could potentially be mouse, the machine has to learn what a mouse is. It has to learn what a desk is. It has to learn what does it mean to be on the desk, right? It has to learn to interpret this whole phrase and all the words in it in such a way in order to make this prediction. So it needs to understand words and text semantics. Uh, another big advantage, so it's a really hard problem. Another big advantage of this problem is that there's unlimited training data. So unlike what we had before, where we have humans that label something as positive or negative, here we can just use text because we're automatically corrupting it and automatically uncorrupting it. Yeah, so we have unlimited training data for an extremely difficult problem. And so the idea then is we have unlimited training data, an extremely difficult problem. We train a gigantic transformer architecture to solve this task with huge GPU clusters. So this is very expensive, uh, but then we have a model that can perform this type of natural language task very well. And the idea essentially is that once we have a trained neural language model, this trained neural language model contains syntactic and semantic knowledge. So essentially this serves as a stand-in for the world knowledge that we humans have. Yeah? Because the only way it can solve this task if it learns so many things, and that means this, this knowledge is somehow in this model. Yeah? Uh, and if you wanna try out these models, they're online, many of them. For instance, you can use these models to predict missing words. So this is a web demo that I used. Um, you can enter like a word like a <laughs> on the desk. And what you see here are predictions. So this particular language model thinks the most likely thing to be on the desk is a book, followed by a note, followed by a file, followed by a lamp, followed by a notebook, right? And maybe somewhere, maybe somewhere there's also mouse. Yeah? Uh, and so, but it can make these predictions for any text that you type in. And that means that this knowledge, some sort of an approximation of natural language understanding is somehow in this, in this, in this model. And they can be used to generate text. Uh, and basically, they are, they, we use them as a stand-in as general linguistic world knowledge. Uh, and this is a, a huge research area. So my group is also doing a lot of research in this area. Um, and especially over the past two and three years, a large amount of models have been released. I think very well known are BERT and extremely well known is also GPT-3, which was released last year. This is exactly this. GPT-3 is nothing but a language model trained over gigantic amounts of data. Uh, so now that we have the language model, how do we do the text classification? So remember, our task is to do sentiment analysis. So we have a text that we put in, the movie was great, and we want to have a distribution over the classes that we defined. Yeah? And so what we do is we take this text, we have a pre-trained language model, we put it in there, and then we retrieve the hidden state of the output layer. So this is essentially a vector representation of the semantics of this text. Uh, and this is then input into a linear uh, classifier that predicts a distribution over a predefined set of classes. So in this image, let's say we have five classes. Very often you have sentiment with, with five classes where you have very positive, positive, neutral, and so on. So you have five classes. Uh, and the linear classifier then is trained to predict a distribution over these classes. Yeah? Um, and what is important is that the linear classifier is randomly initialized. This is classic machine learning. All the weights in this linear classifier are randomly initialized and they're trained from scratch using the training data. The language model, on the other hand, is already comes already pre-trained because we trained it to do this other task with the word predicting the missing words. So this model is already pre-trained and all we have to do is fine tune it for the task that we want to use it for, okay? And so this is deep learning. So we then train the entire architecture. And in doing so, we train these weights from, from the linear classifier from scratch, and we fine tune the language model in such a way that if we input the text, we get an output of the distribution over the classes. Uh, uh, but this of course has a few limitations that we want to address um, because one of the limitations is that the linear classifier is specific to a specific task, right? 
The language model is general, but this classifier is specific with the five classes, let's say, for sentiment analysis. Okay. Uh, and this means that the linear classifier, because it's specific to one task, it cannot be used for other classification tasks. Uh, another problem is that the linear classifier always needs to be trained from scratch because it's randomly initialized. Um, and if it needs to be trained from scratch, it means that we require at least one training example. And that means that the standard approach is in fact conceptually unable to do zero shot classification. So you need at least one training example to, to uh, learn the weights here. And of course, in practice, you need a lot more than just one example. But with zero, you have no hope at all. Okay, so the standard approach cannot do zero shot classification. And so the idea of TARS is now to reformulate text classification into a matching task. So our standard formulation is that text goes in um, and then we predict a distribution over classes. Instead, we do a formulation where the input is a tuple. It consists of a text and a description of a task label. And the output is then a binary variable, true or false. Okay, so we have two inputs and it's a simple binary output. And how does this look like? Okay, let's say we have this is our language model. We have a linear layer and an activation. And, but now we only have two classes, true or false. And the input is now not only the text, but it's also the label or the candidate label. So we're saying we're putting in the movie was great and the potential label positive sentiment. And what the classifier has to tell us whether this match is actually correct or not, All right? Uh, so do this text and label match. So if it outputs true, then we know, okay, the label positive sentiment holds for this text. And if it outputs false, we know that this label does not hold for this text, okay? And because now in the output layer, we don't actually have any classes anymore. We put them into the input actually. Uh, what this means is that we can use the full stack across many different tasks. Because if we want to do a topic detection, all of this stays the same. It's only a matching network. It only tells us true or false. And we put in essentially a hypothesis. This is the text, the white, white, hot state, the white house stated, blah, blah, blah. And the, the label would then be topic politics. And if this output's true, then we know that this topic holds for this text. Okay, so we essentially give it a hypothesis and the network only has to tell us true or false. Okay, side by side, uh, this is the baseline approach. Uh, in the baseline approach, let's say we have two tasks, topic and sentiment, then we essentially always put in only the text and we get an output distribution over the classes. And so essentially the, in, the, the standard approach is given this text, what is the class for this text? Uh, with the TARS approach, it's different. We actually give it the text and the label and we're asking the question, is this label correct for this text? Okay. Um, and so this then can be reused across arbitrary amounts of tasks. Uh, so the entire stack then becomes independent of the number of classes in the task. Uh, this enables a transfer of all parameters between different tasks. And what is most important, if you remember from the beginning that I said that humans get an explanation of the task. In a sense, that's what we're giving the model now because we're not giving it an example, only the example. We're also giving it the label names. We're saying essentially, is this topic of this text is this um, politics, right? So the semantics is not only by example, but also by the natural language description of the labels. And this then makes zero shot classification possible because now I can put in any, any label text pair and I get a true false prediction. Yeah? So we did a lot of experiments with this and it's a pretty big table. So, and the paper actually has even more tables. So um, maybe to zoom in just on one part of it. So what we do is we train the model on one data set, one task, and then we see how well it does on a different task. But on this different task, we give it only zero or a very small amount of data. And this is this K that you see here. So if the K is zero, that means we give it zero examples. If we give it one example and so on. Uh, and then what you see is the TARS approach and you can see the baselines, so a standard BERT model and a standard transfer learning approach. And what you can see, I mean, this is too many numbers, but maybe just to summarize it, what you can immediately see is that only TARS is able to do zero shot prediction um, because the other models are conceptually unable to do it. Um, but also you can see that TARS is actually pretty good in the regime 
where there's not so much training data compared to the uh, alternatives, right? So if you don't have so much training data, TARS seems to be doing quite well. Um, Alan, if I can just um, chime yes. in for a second. So um, the zero shot, so as I get it, you provide essentially the label and the data as input for the model to just tell you is that true or false. But if you have a new task, that's still a new label that the model has never seen. So how do you encode this into the network? That's sort of the, the part that I'm not clear yet. Yes, that is a great question. Actually, and I should have actually pointed this out in more detail. So mm -hmm. the main point is that the language model can somehow interpret text already, right? Because the language model, we pre-trained it on a different task. Um, this missing word prediction and the mm -hmm. language model then has some capability to in quotation marks understand language and this is why it's very important that we phrase the label in natural yeah. language okay so, Thank you. so it could be the label could mm -hmm. be the sentiment of this text is positive or something like this mm -hmm. right and so when we train tars it learns to interpret the text it learns to interpret the label the semantics mm -hmm. of the label and then yeah. it learns to understand if it's a matching semantics or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, may I ask another question? question in the chat? Yes, go ahead. Um, so you use the information of the language model, which is internally um, computed due to the math language task. Do I understand it correctly? Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, but that means that it's also dependent on what text the bird model was trained, kind of. So I'm, I'm thinking about specific tasks in specific um, fields. So do I understand it right? Um, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. So domain is always a huge, huge thing in everything that we do, especially if we do transfers. In fact, I mean, if you look at the next slide, this is like a cross domain transfer. So in the paper, we all, all we evaluated essentially the semantic distance, right? Mm -hmm. So if the one thing that you've pre-trained on and the other thing that you're then trying to learn from a few examples, if this new thing is so different from everything that you've done before, then actually the model doesn't work so well. Uh, and if it's partially similar or somewhat similar to the things that you've done before, the model can do quite well. All right, thank you. There is one more question <clears throat> in the chat. What about ironic sentences? GPT-3 is, to my knowledge, able to identify these stars also? Um, so ironic sentences, I mean, so generally, GPT-3 is a language model, right? So TARS essentially is using a language model. So if we, if we build TARS around GPT-3, it would theoretically have the knowledge of GPT-3. So, so it's not like there are equivalents, right? So, they, so TARS is basically this whole thing and GPT-3 would be one option for doing the language model. I mean, we use BERT, but you could also use, if GPT-3, it's not available, but if it were available, you could put any other language model in there, right? Thank you for your answer. <laughs> and yeah, Jordi. Also, yeah, thank you. Uh, so I have a question about restrictions on text, uh, on actually task labels. So do you have any grammatical restrictions, like it shall be only two nouns or something else, or you have some kind of language description. So for instance, any fixed number of tokens can be only used as a, a task label or yeah, just just wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a very good question. So, um, we are in the process of evaluating alternatives, and somebody else actually evaluated. There's a blog post out there. Maybe I can look it up. Evaluated the impact of different label descriptions on how well TARS actually works because we made it openly available so anybody can use it and try it out, right? And one person did like a nice evaluation of different different label um, descriptions and found that of course it does make an impact like how how you phrase the label um, I'm not sure if that person evaluated for length so but my assumption would be that 
it can do maybe like a sentence or like a longer sentence, but I mean, all the language models currently kind of break down if the text becomes too long. So you couldn't have like a big, big paragraph. I think that probably wouldn't work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, yeah, so to maybe, oh yeah. So basically that also kind of took away the cross domain. So the, the, if the semantic distance becomes too long, then it starts working not as well anymore, right? Um, but one thing that I want to show you is one last experiment. This is kind of a bit hard to follow. So I hope, hope you, can, you can read this graph. So essentially we, we took one TARS model and we sequentially trained it on one task after the other, but at each task, we evaluate how well it can do each task, okay? So we have five different tasks. That's Amazon, Yelp, DBpedia, AG News, and Trek. These are just different data sets and different tasks. And we first train it on Amazon, then on Yelp. And after each training, we check how well it can do all five tasks. Yeah? And so if we begin with Amazon, this is the first one that we trained, it can do Amazon the best. It can kind of already do Yelp. And it can even because, I mean, for all the other tasks, it's zero shots, but it's still doing something, right? It's still kind of doing these other things. And now in the second thing, we now train it with Yelp. And we can see that it can still do everything. It hasn't really forgotten Amazon. It can still do Amazon even a little bit better than before. And it can do all the other tasks also, well, slightly better than before. And these are actually very similar tasks. Now we train it over Debipedia. That's a topic detection task. We can see that suddenly, okay, now it's able to do Debipedia really well. Uh, it's able to do other things better now, and it still hasn't forgotten the first two tasks, at least not so much. Yeah. Uh, then we train it over AG News, and then we suddenly it can do AG News really well, um, and so on. And then we do it a track, and track is very different from everything else. It can suddenly do track really well, and it forgets, of course, a little bit the previous task, but not so much. Yeah. And then we train it again in the same sequence, the same five tasks. And what we can kind of see that while there's some forgetting happening on average, right? On the five task average, it is monotonically increasing. Well, I mean, towards the end, it's kind of leveling, leveling off, but you know, it is increasing. And so this kind of shows us that this formulation is maybe quite well suited for doing, for having one model that learns to do many different things. Like I mentioned in the beginning, like a human, learning more and more tasks. Uh, I mean, this was only one experiment. We're doing more experiments in this direction, but it kind of shows some, some promise, we think. So to summarize this, um, uh, TARS, the good, the good part first, TARS outperforms the baselines on most few shot scenarios. TARS can do zero shot classification, and it can in fact learn many tasks in sequence. There are challenges, and the two biggest ones are that the semantic distance between the source and the target task is quite important. Uh, and there's actually computationally, TARS is actually not effective <laughs> or efficient because we actually, so we have to, because we have to query each hypothesis, right? So we need a separate forward pass to the transformer for each candidate label. And this, this is computationally actually not, not so great. So maybe there are better ways to do this. Yeah? I mentioned this, we release TARS, we release everything. So and as part of the Flare framework, we have a pre-trained TARS model that was trained over nine different tasks. It has surprisingly strong zero-shot capabilities, depending on what, what your task is. And I do recommend that you try it if you have a use case with very little training data, or you have use cases with imbalanced data. It could be that it actually works quite well there as well. Um, you could try it. So some people have been extremely happy with it. And some people were somewhat disappointed. So it really depends on whether your task is somewhat similar to these nine tasks that we trained it with, uh, or if you want to train a new TARS model with even more tasks. It's not on the slide, but I do want to point out that we have a new and improved TARS coming up, which will be way better than this one that we have in there, uh, because we've been doing more research and we've improved this approach uh, since. So that brings us to the third part, but I think I've run out of time, which is kind of expected. So what I will do is I will skip everything except for introducing Flare because I always have to introduce Flare. So it's the framework that we, that we develop in my group together with the open source community. 
uh, we're now in version 0.8.1 actually. Um, we have a huge open source community. We have over 160 contributors, which is a, an army of people working on it. Um, there is, it's in widespread use in industry and academia. So there's more than 800 other open source projects that are using Flare as a component. Uh, it's been started over 10,000 times, which is a lot. And it's very much open source and completely free. Uh, it's frequently cited among the most popular deep learning frameworks worldwide. And it includes models for many, many different tasks, not only text classification, not only TARS, that I don't have the time to introduce. Yeah. I interrupt with a question uh, about the previous part. Yes. Uh, in the chat, would it help to randomize the training data across tasks for training? And that way you might prevent local minima in the optimization. Um, yes. <laughs> Uh, we tried that and it helps a lot actually so if so if the question means that don't train in sequence just train on all the tasks at the same time right um that helps a lot so um in fact the improved tars model will make use of multitask learning and just mix all the tasks together in one big bag and learn everything at the same time yes thank you um Yes, so I skip over the rest because I think we run out of time. I think I might have a final slide somewhere. Um, one thing maybe to, to finish up this Flare stuff is that Flare is now integrated into the Hugging Face model hop. That means that many of our models, not all of them, are now online in the Hugging Face model hop. And you can use this, this interface to search the models and you can actually try them out online. So at least our sequence tagging models, there's online demos, and you can see if the model is something that you want to use or not. Yes, to conclude the, 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 the talk, um, I uh, talked about TARS, few shot and zero shot learning for NLP. We're at the beginning of this research. There's a lot of exciting stuff that can be done, but already the first steps seem to be working quite well. Uh, I very briefly introduced Flare as an open source framework for state-of-the-art natural language processing. And I very much uh, welcome everybody to try it out, uh, to get involved. We're an open source community that is making no money. <laughs> and so we, uh, we very much welcome any contributions and any help that we can get. Um, Outlook, sample efficiency, the way we've looked at it in this talk has been, has been concentrated on text classification on a downstream task. But what we really after in my group is sample efficiency in the language model itself, okay? So GPT-3, you guys know it, right? It's been, it's the big, big important language model. And this one was actually trained over 500 billion tokens of text, billion tokens of text, yeah? So a gigantic corpus of text. It's one model cost like 20 million euros to train because it, it requires a huge GPU farm, right? Uh, and of course, when you're doing research, you don't just train one model, you train like 10 models or 100 models. And so you can imagine the costs and the data requirements and the GPU requirements that are necessary to train something like GPT-3, as, as impressive as it of course is. And now if you contrast this, because we always use you know, the human as an inspiration, the average child, there are studies that say that the average child actually hears 5 million words per year, not billion, million, okay? And so the average child can, still, I guess, speak better language than GPT-3, even though it hears six orders of magnitude less data. Yeah? And so one of the big questions that motivate my group are the question, well, okay, this is a bit, so can we, can we actually create equivalent models to GPT-3 with much fewer training data, right? So this is kind of our goal. And for this, we actually have now just started a very big DFG project Eidetische uh, Repräsentationen natürlicher Sprache, eidetic representations of natural language. This started actually last month. Uh, it runs for six years and we are hiring across the board. So if you're looking for well, PhD positions or looking for student positions, uh, we have um, this project and actually three other projects that are simultaneously starting. So with industry partners, we have quite a few projects and they all kind of go in this direction of how can we make our language modeling more, more effective? How can we, how can we um, learn from, from, uh, from very few examples? Um, 
And also, of course, all the projects always have a very strong open source component. So in my group, everything has to be open source. Everything has to be reproducible. So if this is interesting to anybody, um, uh, hit me up. We are hiring, like I said, across the board. OK, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ellen. Um, for, so we already had a good number of um, questions during the talk. I would like to maybe get to slightly more technical, more philosophical questions. So at the end, for instance, right? So yes, children hear only 5 million words a year. But of course, they get other inputs. They get multiple input from video, from whatever. And I did my master's thesis on, on emotion detection and spoken language, for instance. And so, of course, like prosodic analysis. And so that's, of course, another question, right? Would this help? Or how would, how would you go about this in the zero-shot framework if you have multimodal inputs, probably? Um, we're thinking about right to use video or audio in addition with the written text essentially yes absolutely so essentially it is one big work package of this of this project and actually mm -hmm. of another project as well is the question like you said i mean of course it's an unfair comparison right because the average child is not just hearing language the average mm -hmm. child is seeing things it can interact you know it's exactly. not just it's not just consuming it's actually interacting yeah. with the world so the question is can we build models that go way beyond like only like our very narrow NLP view mm -hmm. of the world? Um, and the first step, of course, is multimodality. So we mm -hmm. use image data, maybe, I mean, video is very challenging, but I mean, image data yeah. is, is realistic, mm -hmm. right? Um, but also another project that we have in the planning currently is with the robotics department at the HU. Mm -hmm. And here is now the idea that, um, so we would have a robot. <laughs> You know that can that can interact with the world. So the robot can mm. consume language, it can it can see, but it can also do stuff. Yeah, mm. and then we have this is very you know very um, very moonshot. But um, mm. the idea then is to really look beyond like how it's typically done and see if we can achieve a sample efficiency in this ground grounded language universe. Right. Yeah, there's another question from the chat. Irene, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, the question is, have you experimented with meta learning to your problems? Um, meta learning is um, also part of this project idea. So we do want to do use meta learning, especially when we're looking at sample efficiency for the language modeling part. So you could phrase this as a meta learning task, where essentially the task is you want to optimize language models that that learn in a sample efficient way. So we haven't really done it yet, but it is it's very much planned. So I'm happy to take any input if you have ideas in that direction. A couple of more in the chat now. Hermann Stolte, do you see ways to generalize approaches like TARS or language modeling to other types of data like time series? Um, time series as in, let's say, scientific data or financial data. Hmm. So difficult. <laughs> yeah. So I would have to think about how that could be done. So right now, I mean, it's very much semantics based, like natural language semantics based. Mm -hmm. So we would have to really think about how, how it could be done. Yeah, it's going through my head. I mean, that's sort of where we can be really envious of written texts, like you said, that the task you learn can be phrased in the same well, literally language as the data itself. That's something that's very unique to language, of course, in our way of understanding the world essentially and how, yeah, where the data comes from in the first place. All right, um, another question, Martin Dirva, if you learn the semantics from the text corpus, how would you suggest to ensure the integrity of the corpus and the learned knowledge? Bias, discrimination, fake facts, so, good question. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a very good and huge question, right? So this is actually one thing that um, the whole discipline is super interested in right now, and it's really important. So, and it's actually multiple questions. So one question is like, how do we know, like, if the facts that the model is learning aren't wrong, and how, how do we know that they're not biased? So this is something that I believe probably needs to be handled on the level of the language model. Um, there is, I think, no easy answer, but it is definitely a huge focus of research right now. Um, another, oh goodness, this is, uh, sorry, we'll butcher your name uh, again, Tosha. 
I think um, sounds possibly Aldenian, but I'm not sure. Forgive me if I'm totally wrong. In slide nine, the output is binary without any supervision in the case of zero shot learning. Are you doing clustering in this case? Um, I guess the question yeah, I raised at the time. It's a good question. Um, so the uh, it's it's it is zero shot for the target task, but first it is wait where I Oops, I went too far. It's like nine. Uh, it's like nine. Right. Uh, Probably this one, right? Or this is supervised. Correct. It's eleven. <laughs> yes, eleven. Yes. Okay. Um, um, yes. So the point is that this architecture can also do nothing if it was never trained on anything, right? Because this linear layer is first initialized randomly, so it needs to know at least one task in order to have learned the matching logic, because the matching logic is something that needs to be learned, that one text and one label. So essentially the way we are evaluating this is that we train a model on one task and this is normal training. So in this case, it learns how to do the matching. And then once it knows how to do the matching, then we train it on a new task only with zero examples or with, with one example, right? Okay, um, there was um, feedback from Anastasia Tsukala, but I think that was just a comment. If it is actually a question, then please go ahead and unmute yourself or, because um, I'm not 100% sure. And in the meantime, um, there's one more from Anke Tadnala. How was the number of labels for each task? Was it fixed to say two or varying across the task? It was varying, so I don't, I took out the slide because I had too many. Mm -hmm. um, um, but I can maybe, so Yelp and Amazon had five labels. Then DBpedia has about 20 labels. Uh, AG News, I forgot, but it was, it was all like somewhere in the, it was not like a hundred labels. So I think the maximum was maybe 25 labels or something like this. So between five and 25. Although actually, no wait, this one, it was this one track six has, I think, up to 50 labels. Yeah. Okay. And another one from Gregor Falls. Does the sentiment analysis work for multilingual examples? No, <laughs> but um, it could be trained. So, I mean, so the, the model that we package in Flare it was trained for English. But uh, Flare is not only the, the models, but it also gives you the routines to train your own models. So in fact, we, we actually, most of the models that we have in Flare are actually from the community that trained them. So if you have a nice data set for, let's say German or English or multilingual sentiment analysis, then you can very easily use Flare to train your own model. And in fact, this is something that I've been wanting to do. So I actually do want to package like at least a German sentiment classification model and maybe one multilingual one. So this has been on my list forever. So at some point we will probably train a model also and put it into Flare. But in the meantime, if you want to do it, we would be very happy. Um, there's a question from Klaus Kades and I think we need to wrap up now too. So if you have some final questions, you may post them, but I'm not sure if we'll get to them anymore, but this is sort of the last call in the, um, in the pub and class wonders how well does the model perform and train and tested on a single data set in comparison to BERT? How well, yeah, we have these numbers. I have to remember. We also mm -hmm. did it. So I think it is competitive, but the standard formulation is probably better, right? Because it is kind of like an, an awkward way of phrasing things. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the end, the transformer is very powerful, so it can probably work around around that. Um, it is comparable or slightly less good than the standard formulation, I would say. So then the final question from Fabio Barth, do you have a clue why the Amazon task has the same accuracy overall? Uh, yes, Zero task. Is there any... I, can, I can tell you why that is because... Yeah, it's very noticeable at this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Not Amazon much. has five classes five sentiment classes, which are five stars, okay? So if I wrote, I really, uh, it's a good product and I give five stars, then it, this example counts as five stars. But somebody else might write, this is a good product and give three stars, 
right? Because it's it's um, it's very noisy, is what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. right? People give different amount of stars mm -hmm. for the same text, and this means that actually this prediction is somewhat ill phrased. So yes. I, I would not recommend doing Amazon in this way because it's actually <laughs> impossible to understand how many task stars a person would give for a good product, right? Yeah, that's actually interesting. A very um, very practical <laughs> limitation at the very end. We've all been there. So uh, thank you again, Alan. I would wrap it up at this point. Um, I think there's a lot of food for thought um, in exactly this this issue. I, I always find this probably the most important part is how you phrase this machine learning problem, right? Rather than, or at least as important as massive data, which of course is important, is also how do you really set up the question and what is the task in the end that the machine learns to do? And in the zero shot learning, this is exactly how it becomes possible, right? You sort of rephrase the problem and suddenly there is a solution. And so maybe we can learn from that in other application domains like natural sciences. I think it's um, definitely been a very nice presentation for us to, to think about. So thank you again, Alan, for joining us today. And thanks everyone for joining this special hybrid seminar as part of the KIDA series, lecture series. And um, Irene, do you know when the next KIDA talk is? We should probably announce that, but because they're irregular, I don't have it on my... Um, oh, there is no date there. Uh, there is no date yet. Okay, then it's after the summer. So please stay tuned. Please check out the website for future talks in the SIDA lecture series. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for inviting Thank me. You.